might be thinking, the hidden spirituality of the Matrix is an oxymoron because it's not hidden. And trust me, I get it. Even writing this script was hard because how do we make an episode without basically just describing every scene in the movie? We could probably write an hour long dissertation on the spiritual illusions in the Matrix and still not run out of things to talk about. But listen, it's important to remember that what might be more obvious aspects of spirituality to some may be hidden to others. After all, this is one of the most essential points of the movie. So let's get into it and see what we find. Now, as far as I can tell, The Matrix is a documentary about real life disguised as a sci-fi action movie. O okay, well, maybe not completely, but like 90%, give or take, right? To me, The Matrix feels like an encoded message for humanity about the awakening process and about what we personally go through internally as we discover the truth and step into a greater understanding of life. The film elegantly weaves together a narrative of biblical references, genius literary devices, symbolism, fantastic storytelling, and meaningful character moments, giving us a movie that actually becomes something so much more than just a film. It becomes an idea that stands for something very personal to all of those who connect with it. Wake up, Neo. The screen reads on his computer when Neo is first introduced. Certainly, he's asleep and needs to wake up, but this is an innuendo, as this very act sets him on the path of awakening to the greater truth of what's going on. As the experience of the film occurs within the electrical impulses in our minds as we watch it, we bear witness to this man, Neo, Discover that the reality he's been living within is an illusion as he frees himself from the artificial reality and moves into the real world. A place where humanity is grown in tubes as an energy source for artificially intelligent robot overlords. Although I have to say that MatPat and the film theorists did a really good job of demonstrating that the real world we're shown in the movie may just be another layer of encoded reality within the matrix. It's completely brilliant and I recommend watching that after this. Anyway, Neo, a name which is an anagram of one, is set upon this path of self-discovery, learning that he is, in fact, the one, the prophesied individual who can liberate humanity from the control of the machines. His story, which in this film ends with his death, rebirth, and ascension, largely draws upon the stories of Christ. Like Jesus, Neo was prophesied to arrive, perform miraculous feats, dies, and resurrects, but like in a more modern kind of way. In fact, if this wasn't made clear by the end of the film, we are told it outright, right at the beginning, when the guy at Neo's door says, you're my savior, man, my own personal Jesus Christ. Although it might be worth mentioning that Neo is more of a Gnostic Christ than straight up Jesus, in that much of his own liberation happens through the breaking of illusions, a common idea within Gnosticism. Speaking of spiritual and religious allegories, we also see the Matrix speak on Samsara, a Buddhist concept of the cyclical nature of the world, and sometimes even taken to mean a cycle of aimless drifting, wandering, or mundane existence. Much of Buddhist philosophy speaks of freeing yourself from the cycles of samsara. And this is demonstrated as Neo frees himself from the matrix, the world where he is Thomas Anderson, a boring old programmer for some big company. But then the process continues, for Morpheus continually guides him after that to free his mind even once his body is free. The idea of freeing yourself from one reality and birthing into a new one is a concept that spans far back into history in other ways too. Diving into the ancient mystery schools, we see spiritual death and rebirth being something that initiates actively strived to experience. This was an ego death, the death of the old illusion, the old self, and birthing into a new paradigm, something that Neo does twice in the film, first in his transition between the matrix and the real world, and second when he is killed by Agent Smith, and is reborn moments later by the power of love. Yet all of this comes about as a result of something very significant in the earlier part of the movie, Neo's choice. As we know, Neo is brought to a meeting with Trinity, who is named after the Holy Trinity. We see several Trinities in the movie too, including the partnership between Neo, Morpheus, and Trinity, and also with the agents, Smith, Brown, and Jones. The film even begins and ends with room 303. And on that note, Neo's room is 101. He is the one after all. When Neo and Morpheus meet face to face, Morpheus explains that nobody can be told what the matrix is. You have to be shown and offers him the decision between the red pill or the blue pill. Now, there's several layers to this, but first let's focus on this. For Neo, it all boils down to this choice, the truth or living whatever life, whatever fantasy he wants to live out. Sometimes we take our choices for granted, 
But the hidden lesson here is that we are regularly invited to make this choice every day of our lives. By our very actions, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, what we spend our time involved in, we are choosing if we want to create and live a life of discovery, of experiencing greater truths, of ego death, or just enjoying the illusion of the world that is put in front of our eyes. Of course, in the film, Neo picks the red pill and undergoes an experience of his consciousness reconnecting with his true body in the real world and waking up there. This describes the discovery of truth and it completely shatters his understanding of everything, but further illustrating an important aspect of the awakening process. We could relate this with a plant medicine experience because sometimes the plant medicine will show you something very difficult to see. It might even make you purge, but once you've come to terms with it, you begin to grow exponentially as a person, which happens as Neo learns to fight, rapidly downloading all of these martial arts methods over the course of the day. But the concept here of shattering illusion is really something that happens to all of us in life with or without plant medicine. For example, growing up in the world, we are often taught or shown specific ideas, ideologies, and just tons of media programming that gives us this particular image of the world. But then later you realize something greater. For example, maybe it's that those advertisements were showing you something really fun or exciting to sell you something really unhealthy. Candy and soda industries, I'm looking at you. But the matrix takes us even deeper down the rabbit hole than just this. And speaking of rabbit holes, it very openly gives us several references to Alice in Wonderland, an age old story about a girl who breaks free of her everyday reality into a strange and different world. And where the matrix goes is that it invites each of us to ask, what if this entire reality is an illusion, a construct within our minds, an illusion that we're collectively living out? What's especially amazing about this is that it's actually completely true in three different ways. One is that everything that you ever experience is all information that is relayed within the brain. When you stub your toe, it's your brain that identifies the pain. And Morpheus explains this by asking Neo, what is real? How do you define real? If real is what you can feel, smell, taste, and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. This explanation alone gives rise to the deeper understanding that all is within. The second way the matrix describes that all of reality is an illusion is that we are now seeing today that everything we think of as the physical universe on a quantum level is almost entirely empty space and little bits of quantum data flying around, giving us the perception that reality is tangible and solid. The matrix describes this by the idea that reality entirely exists within a really big VR MMORPG simulation of 1999 and reminds us that there is no spoon. It's not the spoon that bends, it's you. Everything is an energetic reflection of you. And third, perhaps one of the most direct revelations about reality being an illusion is that the film gives us this indication that we have become so saturated with digital media, advertisements, and programming that we have lost all sense of what is really real. A lot of our deeper, more intimate personal connections with each other are lost because we have become glued to our technology instead. And the matrix subtly illustrates this by the contrast of reality inside the matrix versus outside. The film essentially illustrates the concept of a collective consciousness, a collective dream. And this is another bridge to the world today. See, Morpheus is named after the Greek God of dreams, whose name literally means one who forms, giving us this idea of Morpheus as a bit of a guider of dreams, almost akin to the Greek psychopomp, helping Neo navigate the various planes of reality that he walks in. Further, the Greek Morpheus used these two gates, the gates of horn and ivory, to distinguish dreams that were real and those that were illusions. This is another layer that is implied by those two pills earlier on. We also see Morpheus's ship, the Nebuchadnezzar, which is a biblical reference of a king who was haunted by his dreams. And as evidenced by the story, the real world does seem to be a bit like a nightmare. Astromythologically, we can gain even more insight here by learning about Neptune, which tells us that we are dreaming our reality into being, but that we must be mindful that some things are seductive illusions, and there is always a greater truth and reality to be discovered. But in that, we are invited to draw upon our creative imaginations to dream a world into being that is in harmony with the rest of the natural world. In the matrix, the people who live inside of it don't know about their octopus spider bot overlords, and they don't really care because they are concerned with other day-to-day -day things. So what reality are they collectively dreaming? Well, 
one where they go to work and live their lives and nothing out of the ordinary ever happened. Cypher illustrates this very well with his betrayal, mirroring the betrayal of Judas in the Bible. See, Cypher turns over Morpheus to Agent Smith, and as he's monologuing, giving Tank some time to get his gun, he explains his thinking, mirroring one particular mindset that is not uncommon in today's world. You call this free, he asks, alluding that the reality in the matrix is so much more diverse with more possibilities for freedom than the quote unquote real world. Cypher wants to return to that old way of life, to the world before he was woke. But this is a fool's errand. Once you know the truth about something, there's very little forgetting, except maybe in Cypher's case where he was going to have his mind erased. Now, speaking more of the villains, we also must talk about Agent Smith. During the scene where he's got Morpheus trying to extract the codes, he says some very interesting things. He begins by reflecting upon the collective unconscious, the same thing we just looked at, the state of humanity, the way they live their lives, and then recounts the history of the matrix, explaining how people must define their reality through misery and suffering. A perfect world was not meant to work. They tried it, but to no avail. Logically, he's not wrong because at this stage of human history, we are in a stage of suffering. Though as many wisdom teachings would describe, we are simply passing through between two golden ages of light. Now this is evident even today, there is so much suffering because we haven't yet learned how to live in harmony with each other and the planet. And so the machines actively just encoded the matrix based around the average level of consciousness of the people whose minds populated the matrix. Hmm, what the robots didn't try though, was starting their simulation in the 1990s and then create this evolutionary program to help humanity learn and heal and become harmonious beings. Then again, maybe they wouldn't have done that because this particular AI consciousness doesn't seem to have much of a heart. As we learn in the sequel film, they have wiped the matrix several times and have become exceedingly efficient at it. But in addition to that, he also says this very interesting thing, that humans are not actually mammals because mammals create equilibrium with the surrounding environments. But humans, we move to an area and multiply and then use all of the resources. And the only way humans can survive is to spread to another area. There is another organism on this planet that follows this pattern. And that is called a virus. A very deep and heavy hitting line, especially right now, given our current situation. We are invited to see that our behavioral patterns and the way that we live our lives is not in harmony with the world but it could be if we would all just wake up, just like Neo is doing throughout the film. Agent Smith describes that he doesn't like the smell of people. He can't stand it and he wants to get out. He wants to be free of this prison, this zoo, whatever you want to call it. Now, I know his intentions are probably not very good, but him explaining his feelings like this actually might give us a little bit of compassion for Agent Smith, who really just sounds like he wants to live a higher life for himself, exist in a better reality, but he can't because he's programmed to have to wrangle all of the humans together. And as long as Zion exists, a biblical reference to Israel, he cannot ascend in his own right. At any rate, throughout the entire Morpheus rescue and then fighting Smith afterwards, Neo continually believes in himself more and more until he comes to be the embodiment of a fully ascended being. After his death and he returns to life, he takes out Agent Smith and we see him take a moment to do some full body breathing and he breathes life through the walls around him as well, showing his interconnection with the energy and the computer code that makes up reality. Now I wonder when he died, if his consciousness entered the space between his physical body and his matrix body or some other dimension, so that when he returned back to life, he brought with him some deep wisdom about the workings of the universe. And that's why he could see the code. Truly, this is no different than what so many people report after having a near death experience. And we're still just scratching the surface here on this movie. One aspect of the film that we didn't discuss was the visit to the Oracle, this all knowing wise woman who guides the awakening souls through the matrix. The plaque above her door says, know thyself, something that Neo does by the end. And a rather significant line of hers was, don't worry about the vase. And then he breaks it. She follows this by saying, what's really gonna bake your noodle later is would you still have broken it if I hadn't said anything? The reason this is significant is because the Oracle leaves him with some wisdom and advice. You're not the one kiddo. Advice that ultimately leads Neo to believing in himself and his ability to save Morpheus by putting others in front of himself. But if she hadn't told him that, would he really have gone to save Morpheus? Much like a few of the other movies we've covered, 
the matrix carries a multitude of layers of spiritual depth, some of which are laid bare for all to see and others that require a little bit deeper exploration. 